Bienvenue à la Cinématique Suisse. Et donc, j'ai le plaisir ce soir de vous présenter cette, euh, cette, cette séance spéciale en présence des invités d'un film qui s'appelle Un Possible Project. Et donc, probablement, vous avez déjà lu le synopsis dans le, dans, dans, dans le catalogue de la Cinémathèque. Et, on va, et je ne vais pas vous raconter plus, mais je, je voudrais juste dire que euh, pour, pour moi, ça, ça a beaucoup de sens que la Cinémathèque, en tant qu'une institution qui, qui sauvegarde les, la, la pellicule, euh, montre des, des œuvres comme ça qui parle justement d'une un, sorte de digital detox et que, qui, qui parle justement d'un support qui, est, qui était en voie de disparition mais qui revient encore un tout petit peu. Euh, donc moi je, je, je vais juste vous présenter nos, nos invités de ce soir et je vais, je vais leur laisser aussi un peu, euh, euh, je, je vais leur demander de, de dire deux mots avant le film et après le film on va revenir pour, pour, pour une séance de questions réponses un peu plus, euh, un peu plus longue. Euh, donc euh, nous avons le plaisir d'accueillir parmi nous euh, Jens Meurer, le réalisateur du film. Bonsoir. <rires> bonsoir, bonsoir. Et Florian Caps. Le, le, le personnage principal du, du documentaire que vous allez voir sur l'écran. Thank you. Bonsoir. Euh, il faut dire que c'est incroyable de voir une salle de cinéma avec beaucoup de gens. Euh, euh, c'est l'été euh, à dehors, mais ça c'est un bon film. Et je m'excuse, il faut parler français, bien sûr, mais mon protagoniste extraordinaire, il préfère l'anglais autrichien. Et c'est pour cette raison que je vais changer et je vais parler un petit peu d'anglais. Nous sommes très heureux d'être ici en Switzerland aujourd'hui. Merci pour nous avoir. Um, Doc et moi avons été. C'est Doc. Je suis le directeur, il est le protagoniste. So He does. He hates it when I talk and talk and talk. So I'm going to talk for, for a long time, <laughs> because in the film he does all the talking. Um, it's been a long journey. In fact, this film started uh, about this time ten years ago. Uh, it's a documentary about. It's not just a documentary about analog or saving Polaroid. It's also a documentary about going the other way when the whole world is going this way. Sometimes this might be the better direction for us. You'll see more in the film. It was shot on 35 millimeter as a documentary. When we started doing this in uh, 2013, everyone uh, thought we were completely crazy. Um, they were right. But this man is completely crazy. And so this was the only way to go. That's enough for me. I'm sure Doc wants to say something. I'm very happy to show you this German Austrian <laughs> documentary. It's three and a half hours long, black and white, very long <laughs> shots. We're going to have some wine in the meantime, but we'll be here to answer questions afterwards. Enjoy. Doc. Um, there is only one reason that Jens prefers to talk before the film, because usually there are only very few people left <laughs> after the film. I believe that many of you will be still sitting here, hopefully, after the film, so I um, wait. Uh, so we can discuss uh, the film rather than exchanging nice words. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Jens, for, for doing this. Um, he, I had, had to watch it 15 times to understand a little bit what I was doing. So um, anyhow, see you after the film. Thanks for coming. Bonne projection à tout à l'heure. So we can uh, we can speak in English, and uh, apparently nobody needs a French translation. So please, uh, I'll I'll start with some questions, and then we'll also uh, leave the floor to to the to to the audience so that they can also ask their questions. Uh, for the for the first question. Uh, hang on, hang on. Yes. <laughs> You're going to kill me because I didn't bring my 35 millimeter camera. But for all I know, this might be the last time this film ever gets seen with real people. So I want to take a souvenir picture. And maybe you can, my children, they've got to know where I was. So give them a greeting. Wave, give, give it a wave. <laughs> Thank you. OK, that's done. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about your encounter. How did you how did you meet and how did you what's the beginning of this project? How did you decide to make this film? Um, 
You mean this unlucky moment <laughs> back many years ago? Exactly. <laughs> it was very analog. Um, it was, uh, I think, in, in an Italian restaurant in, in Berlin. And uh, uh, we were introduced by by um, the famous Mr. Smolokovsky. Um, and uh, somehow we had a, a very good connection from the very start. Jens just finished another boring film um, <laughs> called uh, Rush uh, about uh, Niki Lauda, another good looking Austrian um, <laughs> person. And he wanted to continue this good run with another good looking uh, Austrian person. So I think that was the main driver back then to think about the film, right, Jens? Yes, it's very right. So it wasn't just Doc's good looks, but mainly that impressed me. But actually, I had not made a documentary for 20 years. Um, I had a long break and I was just producing films like Rush. And um, the guy who introduced us, he was interested in film finance and that's how we met and it was a blind date because I didn't know. <laughs> he just said, I want, do you want to come for lunch? I want to introduce you to somebody interesting. And I had no idea what it was about. But by the end of the lunch I realized I have to start a documentary again and the results you've just seen. Great, uh, and, and you, you told me that you started the project back in 2013. Uh, which was a very special year, let's say, for everything analog. Uh, would you like to comment on that a little bit? I mean, I like want to, to comment on that because Please. that was exactly the plan of Jens. He said, this is the very ambitious guy trying to keep something analog alive. So I want to be there with the camera when he fails <laughs> in latest two years. So, and then everything worked out differently, first of all, Jens, because of his stupid idea to shoot on 35 millimeter, he ran out of budget every six months, so it took ages <laughs> to, you know, do the filming. And I somehow couldn't couldn't accept failure and was keeping keep on going, going, going. And uh, at the end of the day, this was very important because from the moment we started to the moment we finished it, there was a big shift in of of digital and analog which which i think we both you know didn't expect but very much liked um and uh, and so that's that's um how the film started maybe in 2013 but i have the feeling it has not ended yet we are still in the in the beginning this is just a a, a little appetizer of our next 15 film projects, right, Jens? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm going to tell my wife about this, or yours. <laughs> but, um, yeah, well, first of all, 10 years ago, he was a lot better looking even than now. <laughs> and like I said before, for me, it wasn't so much that I was a total Polaroid fan or married to analog. It was also very much about meeting somebody who, who put his money where his mouth was, who really made a decision to stand up for... M something. My money? Sorry? That's a British-English expression. <laughs> I'll explain it to you later. Who had a conviction and who, um, uh, you know, he did something that we need more in this world, of <laughs> somebody saying, I'll just fight for something good. And I think, I mean, even judging your reaction this evening, I think when we look at a world that is more and more polarized and it has identity politics and division and fake everything, this is the opposite. And that's what I fell in love with and um, that's what started me making this film. And then on 35 millimeter, because how could you film Doc and his work <laughs> on, on a digital camera? Of course you couldn't. So what was the what what were the challenges of filming on 35 millimeters back in 2013, especially? Well, actually, none. It was a decision, and like everything that you have, you could decide the next time you love somebody, write them a love letter. Don't send them a WhatsApp message. You know, this evening, read a book and leave your phone uh, outside your bedroom. And that was the same for me. It was a decision that it felt right. And of course, was a bit of a statement to film this film on 35 millimeter just to show that it could be done. 
filming a film on 35 millimeter was new. You know, everyone had been filming on 35 millimeter for 100 years. So all it was the decision to say we're doing this. It did kind of coincide with many of my colleagues sometimes aggressively saying man can you just not let it die and why are you so backward and and so on but uh, you know we quickly realized that it was very liberating and very enjoyable uh, working on film which wasn't the first time we'd done it you know especially because um, the best thing about it I can tell you secret is he always you know I told you it's very expensive so uh, whatever we did, the shooting latest at five o'clock in the evening, the material was gone, <laughs> and we had enough time to go apart to a bar and you know have a few drinks and discuss what went wrong. So it was a very nice way to do the shooting, right? Yeah, and also if, if, uh, <laughs> if a camera roll only has four minutes, even protagonists who like to talk a lot after a while realize that they have to say what they want to say very quickly, or the film will roll out, and that lends the whole process of shooting a film a kind of concentration and an adrenaline that is really enjoyable it, it it's it's a liberation when you can you you all have this when you take pictures of your children or grandchildren or whatever on the phone you can take whatever and then you have thousands and you know you don't know what to do with them you forget them then you change it's gone when you shoot on film you have to think about everything and that's a really healthy process and uh, so uh, we really enjoyed shooting this film on 35 millimeter. And uh, because you had been, al you had also started as as we discussed earlier. You had also started uh, with digital quite early in your in your career when you when you when you produced uh, a film even in the beginning of 2000s on digital, which was quite rare at the time. Well, I'm a little bit older than that, so I didn't really <laughs> start on film. But yes, I, I produced a film called Russian Ark, which was the first film completely in one shot by a Russian director, Alexander Sakurov. And f this could only be done digitally because film rolls aren't long enough. So I didn't return to working on analog because I'm um, you know, old fashioned and I think it's a futuristic thing to work on analog. I think it's futuristic to read a newspaper where you kind of know where it comes from and, and if there's a name in the newspaper you know who wrote it. If you go online everything you don't know anything. So uh, you know my defense is that and I learned this from Doc that <laughs> the authenticity of analog is a is a is a really wonderful asset these days. It doesn't mean there aren't great moments for digital like just now, but mm -hmm. yeah, that's my analog thing and my digital thing. Exactly, and, and I think Doc, for for you as well, it's not uh, it's not like digital and analog; they have to go against each other, right? No, th this is the big learning, and you know, when we started, everybody was afraid that digital will kill analog pretty soon. But then basically um, our own children, my own children, they showed me that maybe digital is the biggest chance analog ever had to be repositioned. And I think that that is the good message. And also, you know, when I look around here, there's a lot of young people and, you know, uh, middle-aged people and uh, old people like myself. It's, uh, you know, it's not a question of generation. And yeah. the good news is that the young, and I was afraid that maybe we lose them to, to the smartphone. It's exactly the opposite. They are so interested. They are so fed up with all the, the learnings that you know a Facebook friend doesn't help you a lot when you have a crisis, and this is a big chance that you know we that that is still driving me of of that that this is important what we are doing. Uh, would you say that there is a sort of a like a material turn where where people are interested also to go back to the to the material that they can touch and they can? And, uh, it, it's very it's very easy. You know, human beings have five senses, and all of these five senses are the only reason we are still here and not eaten up by a tiger long time ago. And <laughs> we need our five senses to take the right decisions. So in digital, 
only can trigger our eyes and ears, mm -hmm. but we need to smell, touch, you know, and to fall in love and trust people. That's it's very easy. You know, it's digital is just totally overrated and unfortunately used by you know big companies for the wrong reasons. And that's that's all. And we get over it. We're gonna survive it. But you know, it's time to to you know work with the next generation on think about how to combine the advantages of digital with the advantages of analog. It's very easy at the end okay. of the day. I, I totally agree. Just before uh, opening up for questions, I, I'll have one uh, trivia question for you. Could you could you let us know a little bit more about your uh, your meeting with uh, Mark Zuckerberg? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we never you know we never ever really personally met this guy fortunately uh, we even found out that you know he, in this when it all started I, I had an idea of a, of a side project and i loved the idea analog research lab and then i put the, it i said okay i i gonna save the domain and i put it into the internet and so okay it's already taken and i found out facebook has <laughs> taken it and then i found out that really there is this analog research lab and they have a two million a two digit million budget uh, of of doing you know reconnecting facebook with reality and there was this incredible nice guy scott who was really in there of you know believing changing the world and you know connecting to us but at the end of the day we found out that this beautiful print shop you know mark zuckerberg has never visited it or not even ask them to print the invitations for his wedding or whatever so you know the whole thing there it's you know like many things close to la i guess in san francisco it's totally f special <laughs> <laughs> Alors, est-ce que, est que vous voudriez poser une question Est-ce qu'il y a quelqu'un qui voudrait réagir à, à quelque chose Et il y, y a un micro qui, qui circule dans la salle. Euh, voilà. Thank you for the movie. I was wondering how the movie was edited. Oh, tough question. <laughs> uh, I have to admit it was edited digitally on Avid. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, they, he didn't tell me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was a big disappointment. Thank you for asking the question. Yeah. He said, I'm in the cutting room, and I was imagining with the scissors and cutting it. But, you know. But it does exist on 35 millimeter. There are 35 millimeter prints. And uh, just a suggestion for the cinematic here, like the um, National Film Museum in Holland, the I, they made their own print, so it's part of the collection there. And um, Doc has a print, and in SuperSense in Vienna, he also has a wonderful projector. And every now and again, um, we watch the film as a 35 millimeter copy. With, with the carbon, you know, the carbon sticks <laughs> still melting. Yes, we, we have that. It's very special. Well, first I wanted to uh, thank you uh, for that fantastic film and for that adventure. Thanks for making us dream and hope and fight. Um, I want to uh, come back to the Polaroid uh, adventure and I, want, I have one question. Why did first Polaroid don't give you the uh, that brand and why that don't did they then join the uh, the, uh, the, the the story you know that's that's a first of all thank you um uh for this question this is a very good question so first of all the, in 2008 um polaroid still had the the idea that the brand is worth many many millions uh, even if they cannot do Polaroid film anymore. So that was my chance to, to buy the, the, the factory for basically nothing, uh, just promising that I will not call it Polaroid, which was ridiculous anyhow, because I, I couldn't call it Polaroid, but New York Times wrote an article and said, okay, the <laughs> Polaroid factory has been back because the format and the brand is melted into one. And what happened then is that Polaroid um, really found out that there is no way to make a lot of money with the Polaroid brand with other products disconnected from the product that we were shooting. It was it was totally 
crazy. For example, they hired Lady Gaga back in the day to be the creative director. And the first thing that Lady Gaga said is, okay, you know, give me some films and make a nice shooting. So the CEO of Polaroid had to call me and said, Doc, can you help me? Lady Gaga wants some <laughs> film, you know, but we are not doing film anymore. <laughs> so I sent him film uh, and then doing the shooting. And so Polaroid, over the years went really into big t problems and then one of of my of, of this you know investors we started conversation with polaroid about licensing the brand and at a certain point this mr smolkovsky and i was gone already by that time he stood up and said okay i cannot negotiate with these idiots anymore i just buy them <laughs> so he bought them for i think 150 millions and stuff like that and since then, it's reunited again. <laughs> so that was the story about the brand. Hello. Um, first, thank you for the movie. I started purchasing Impossible films in 2010 <laughs> uh, while I, I just found my Polaroid camera on eBay. But yeah, starting with a very yeah, uncertain <laughs> film. Ex that experimental. Was, yeah, very exciting. And uh, so, yeah, it's quite uh, exciting to discover the whole story tonight. And I was wondering, it's more, more about yeah, a technical question. We saw in the movie a huge uh, film you combined with a camera chamber. I was wondering if it's something you developed with Impossible first, or if it's something you invented after. W which, which one? Last so format. Uh, the, the big 20 by 24. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no. So the big uh, 20 by 24 camera was basically invented by Edwin Land. Um, um, for the introduction of 8x10 format film for the shareholder meeting. So he had a special camera built for that event. And since then it became very famous because uh, many of the fam most famous photographers wanted to shoot with this big camera. All Polaroid film is produced in, in large roles, so oh. that is a camera and uh, there's only five cameras in the world still existing. and. Um, it's still, it's, sti it's still film out there because the gentleman you saw on the film festival, he's still doing and producing it in small quantities from old stock. So there are two cameras in Berlin, one in Vienna, and uh, two in, in the US. So if you, if you, you know, want, are interested in shooting on a big, you know, just let me know. Absolutely, <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> D'autres réactions, d'autres questions uh, Hello, uh, bravo, really, bravo for this film. Um, just a point, uh, I did create a cine club in the mountains and I would like, if I take the, if I buy the rights for your film, how can I present it to my public before the film. It means what do I have to write? I know what is written on your <laughs> on your uh, catalog, but how can I present you about uh, Polaroid story? About a magician you are? About uh, vintage lovers? The, the good-looking Austrian. Don't forget the good-looking. Uh, about vintage-looking lovers. I am one even and how could could i present it really to make the people coming you know i think the, the important you know we, we are super happy to to help you on that um the, the the good thing is to to get it out of this retro um nostalgic f corner and uh, try to think to you know get the young generation excited because um our experience is that especially you know we we are we have the most difficult positioning because we grew up analog and then digital came. We are still insecure of how to deal with it. We slowly get used to it. We miss the old stuff somehow. But the next generation, the young, they are much more open. You know, for them, digital is 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 done. It's good. It's there. But they are looking 
for you know new adventures and 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 to understand it so but even if he, you know i don't know but i i really love to to even you know show it analog and you know sometimes we go i have an old friend he's 70 years old he has a little this little mobile 35 millimeter projectors yeah and with the sound and even you know sh bad quality you know the images are anyhow not very brilliant <laughs> so that that's important it's, it's it's the it's the experience you know and we we, show, we we you know when we showed it after covid the fact that you're sitting in a room you know you cannot take off your phone you cannot go out you cannot switch to another film to you know th this is already a, an important experience that to watch it with other people in the room and, and stuff like that so we are super, you know, we we are happy to su to support you, in in you know getting the message out because also we want to support the places that's still out there showing films, bringing people together in real life, you know, fighting Netflix and you know everybody getting lazy. Yeah, I I love showing the film to people and with people, and for me, there's something political in the film. So many documentaries are about a crisis here or a scandal there. My whole, after I met Doc, whole thing was, I think it's political to also make a film to show what value there lies in, in creating things together, in, in sticking with an idea. And, uh, and it's not wrong to have positive ideas. Of course, this all is a bit easier to talk about and laugh about um, but Doc has been really fighting and struggling since 2008 um, to keep what you see on this film and what you do every day not just alive but also to spread that message and uh, you know for that reason an evening like tonight or maybe up on your mountain um, somewhere in Switzerland um, th that's kind of a very rewarding thing to do and um, and do it with people. I mean, you know, <laughs> we can have a drink afterwards and we talk to one another. That already, I think, is quite revolutionary now. And I think in this, you know, day and age that we're entering into where AI makes absolutely everything possible, I think it's going to be a golden era for, for something like this because, you, you know, when I shoot my four minutes on a roll, you can't upload it. You can't even see it. You have to send it to a lab first, and then two days later you can see it. The whole slowness, the whole touchability of doing things analog, I think will become very valuable when you can't believe anything anymore. And, um, you know, but people need to believe something and they need to be in contact. And so, good idea. Well, so, yeah. You had a question. Sure. <laughs> Uh, I was That's good. Take away the microphone from Jens. <laughs> That's going to shorten the evening a lot. Thank you very much for doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering about the Sudban Hotel. Uh, how do you see it as a maybe like a analog experimental place f for people to come and have experiment this? Because I believe it's it became too too crowded, too tiny in the in Vienna for the super sense of place or I don't know because all those things are so <laughs> big the machines the technology you know that's, um, that's uh, thanks for asking that you know uh, first of all uh, places like you know we have this crazy Venetian palace and you know even this house uh, and the super hotel these places are play an important role to get people, next generation, um, excited and make them feel, you know, the, what what analog is all about. So places have bec on this journey have become a, a very important um, element because whatever we do, we we can talk about it, we can make PDFs, but when we create places that people come together, you know, they feel it right away. So, for example, in the Super Hotel, we had this big experts 20 experts from all around the world they have been everywhere they you know many of them are millionaires but when they entered the room with the candle lights and the 40 you know it was just you know it was <laughs> the evening was done you know we could we do, didn't even have to 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 talk so super hotel um, has become um, very important for me and there there's a lot of progress Jens doesn't even know but 
uh, I'm very stubborn, so I never gave up. I'm fighting for it and trying that uh, this place is not lost to a super boring big company, you know, trying hard but destroying it, all of it. So there is a new owner since um, one and a half years, and the first thing we did with the new owner is to make a nice private screening with Jens and gave him a lot of champagne and uh, and we had the idea that after that meeting he's the gonna owner, not me yeah the owner <laughs> <laughs> the owner after seeing that scene and you know he would just go come to us and give us a little suitcase with money and the keys to the hotel and say okay you know l let's make that night every night that didn't happen immediately so um, we are still working on that, but hope is not totally lost, so there is uh, still some progress on that. <laughs> but when you are in Vienna, you know, you have to definitely visit, you're right, the Super Sense is a small scale, you know, we have developed all the symbols, so, but now it's, it's about, you know, having more places like that, so the people, the people understand it, but still, everybody, when you are in Vienna, it's just a very easy 10-hour train ride. <laughs> <laughs> Please visit. Merci à vous deux pour ce formidable film. Et merci, merci vous. Donc, uh, d'être un si grand rêveur. Uh, <laughs> d'être un si grand rêveur qui me fait rêver qu'on pourra peut-être continuer à avoir des choix dans la vie uh, si vous si vous vous faites entendre et je trouve euh, moi, je suis très contente de voir ce film ici à la cinémathèque mais euh, je, il y a maintenant vision du réel à Lyon avec euh, beaucoup beaucoup de publics qui sont intéressés euh, par des films documentaires et qui les qui les <rire> qui les font voir à des gens qui vont les pousser plus loin alors je, je J'espère je, qu'il aura une, une vision très grande bientôt. Mm. Oui, merci. Um, well, thank you. The one thing I can say, in a strange way, actually this film has been quite polarizing. So like the film festival you just mentioned, they were not interested. It was not a real documentary for them. Because it's got music, because, uh, you know, it's a... Because the good-looking <laughs> main actors. It's, it's, uh, it, 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 it was quite um, divided, yeah. It's, um, uh, I think there is something in the documentary world that, uh, you know, I should have made a good Austrian feel-bad documentary. <laughs> I just didn't find the right person. Not that he didn't have enough problems. And so, yeah, for example, they were just not interested. Not a real documentary for them. But, but, but there is another aspect because I think, the, uh, you know, during these eight years, sitting in the bars after the film ran out, we were discussing what is what is the what what is this all for? What is our really our mission? And we said, you know, maybe we can inspire people of doing things, you know, that everybody tells them it's impossible because somehow this is is getting harder and harder. So and you saying that, and also you know, many people writing us or me, um, you know, uh, that that somehow watching that film inspired them to stand up for their dreams more often. Um, that, I think, that, that is the, the beautiful um, message of the film. And uh, thank you, Jens, again, for bringing this across and cutting out all the bad <laughs> things so that people still think it's, it's <laughs> worth doing it. Yeah, but it is. This is what, you know, what, we, what we need. And uh, there's so much negative and hate and fake and whatever. Uh, that's, you know, we don't want to say good or bad, we just want to show what can be done when we, you know, believe in our five senses and do the things that, you know, feel right to us, even if it's not maybe a business uh, on <laughs> in the next in the next three, mi uh, three months or going to be a unicorn in, in one and a half years. Uh, just a detail, uh, was that easy to have the original voice of C uh, Steve Jobs? And was that uh, uh, an analog uh, recording, obviously? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Steve Jobs loved the film. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, would, if he would have seen it. Yeah, if he would still be living. Well, you know that Steve Jobs, uh, when he was alive, he had, I mean, you can tell this better, uh, since Apple began or began, began to be a company with employees, um, at first every employee and then later every important employee had their Polaroid taken um, when they joined the company. And there was like a presentation wall, and if I'm not wrong, when he was still alive, when Doc began to reissue that kind of film as Impossible Project, they were selling them in Apple stores. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the funny thing is, um, Steve Jobs was the biggest fan of Edwin Land. So Edwin Land was famous for these keynote speeches of every little detail. You know, you know, he even hired, um, you know. Um, somehow regisseurs to, to teach him. There was live music on stage. He, he even had special um, suc uh, special jackets made so that the cameras fit in the jacket and stuff like that. So Steve Jobs learned a lot from Edwin Land and there have been two or three important meetings of Edwin Land and Steve Jobs. So when I started the Impossible Project, the first, first product we did, it, it's that Instant Lab. It was a camera basically that you can expose your favorite images from the iPhone onto the Polaroid film. So this was basically, my vision was, this is combining the world of Edwin Land with the world of Steve Jobs. So I was always dreaming, okay, with this, I should get an invitation to Apple <laughs> to, to showcase that. And I really did. So I was invited, <coughs> unfortunately, um, Steve Jobs died two or three weeks before I went there, so I couldn't meet him, and uh, it, it was very disappointing, to be honest, being there at Apple. But um, this, you know, Edwin Land and this this vision, and you know, uh, thinking about products up front and changing society, this this is uh, something that closely connected Edwin Land with, with Steve Jobs and. Is nowadays I think um, we, we, we we would need such persons again, and then there is um, Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not too sure. Okay, next question. <laughs> <laughs> on a on a peut-être le temps pour une toute petite dernière question, vous? Oh. Allez-y. Um, <coughs> well, you, you said that your film is not only about technology, but is a bit political film. Um, I, I feel that film as a uh, appeal to resist and to get uh, freedom again, right? Um, my question is, uh, do you uh, think that there is something like a political movement uh, around those uh, issues? Uh, in the film, we see that you are maybe building a kind of network uh, with certain people, the Molesky people, other people. Is this a movement uh, starting? In my dreams, yes. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, you know, it's definitely a movement started. It's a very small movement. And um, thanks to the internet, we, we can connect with other people that have the same vision. But still, you know, and that's also why we try to work with big companies because, you know, like Facebook, because, you know, and I'm doing a big project with BMW at the moment and, you know, with Allianz and, you know, it's all very difficult, but because there's something going on, they find out, they themselves find out that the next generation is not interested in a new app or a new better website. It's about, it's about their own senses and, and, uh, and the reality. So it's a rediscovery of reality, but, you know, it's we still need the ends, and maybe he can commit to the next film right away <laughs> because you know it needs formats, it needs storytelling, it needs the right partners to to get the message out there. The problem is not that you know not everybody might like the film and might connect it, but how can we get this film you know out there that people watch it? You know, we have some success now because it's in in. Qatar Airlines or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that it's just, it, that's always the question. If you do something that, you know, inspire people to think about it, um, it, it can start a movement, but, and how, how can you reach that, that people? So, whenever you have a mountain and a 35 millimeter projector, <laughs> you know, um, you know, 
uh, let's let's share it and some people hate it and some people love it but that's the beautiful thing about it if you just do things that you know nobody cares about you know there is no there is no no progress no evolution I mean, I really like your question, and the best thing about your question is that I can ask you back. <laughs> because it's not up to Doc or me, it's up to all of you. And uh, the good thing is also everything you see that he's doing and other people are doing and that this film hopefully captures and maybe inspires with, it's only radical in the sense that everything is so covered in our lives with commercial, digital, Silicon Valley, but even in Silicon Valley they're desperately looking for things that are real and that they can touch. And, you know, is there a movement? There is a movement. And in a way, Doc's motto of the movement is really, really, really simple. And you all have it in you already. It's just trust your senses. All of you have five senses. Just leave the cinema and use them. And, and that's all it takes, and that is the movement. And I think we probably all agree we need something to stick to, and we need something to resist what's not making our world better. And, and, and we something agree, to we have it in you. Something yeah. to trust, you know, and it's trust your own five senses, trust your gut's feeling, that, that's it. Yeah. And uh, especially in a world where, you know, the, whom, whom else should you trust? There's not much choice anyhow. Not even, you know, not even the structure of a family exists. It sounds much better in front, the French, yeah. you know. I, I, don't, but, you know I, I don't understand it, but it sounds already like a movement <laughs> in French. <laughs> That's why the revolution started in, in France, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a very good point to, to, to finish this uh, Q&A with. Uh, thank you very much, uh, both of you, to, to have been here with us and for your generosity to answer the, the questions. Merci beaucoup à tout le monde et bonne soirée. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Merci.